person. He's got a gun in there. She comes out, says, I'm going to kill you, grabs a knife. He fires in what he believes to be self-defense. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's no other motive, as the state pointed out. This is not a case of, I'm getting a whole bunch of money from you. It's not a case of, oh, there's another lover out there. No, it's a case of two people who kind of had it with each other. He's leaving. She wigs on him in a manner which is not outside the realm of possibility. She, she, he's called her out on taking money from the church. She hits him, goes into the room. He kicks her. He's going to leave. Comes out, I'm going to kill you. Pulls out her knife. It's right next to him. He responds. Now, whether that's reasonable self-defense, we'll argue that. But is there anything hard to believe about it? No. <laughs> he has no reason to shoot her other than this. And I'm sure you saw how Ms. Hoffman and Ms. Bacon reacted when we asked them those questions about Vicki. Like, God no. <laughs> and the whole stabbing her ex thing, that never happened. Again, the only evidence of anything bad about Vicki Hoffman comes from the person who needs you to believe that she was some drunk, crazy, alcoholic, violent psychopath, because that's the only way you can believe him. But the people who knew her said that that could not be farther from the truth.
with usual ordinary caution without any unlawful intent. Or two, when the killing occurs by accident and misfortune in the heat of passion upon a sudden and sufficient provocation. Or three, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat, if a dangerous weapon is not used in the, and the killing is not done in a cruel or unusual manner. <clears throat> a dangerous weapon is any object that will likely cause death or great bodily harm if used in the ordinary and usual manner contemplated by its design and construction. <clears throat> An object not designed to inflict bodily harm may, none, may nonetheless be a dangerous weapon if it was used in a manner likely to cause death or great bodily harm. Great bodily harm means great as distinguished from slight, trivial, minor, or moderate harm, and as such does not include mere bruises. I now instruct you on the circumstances that must be proved before Steve Lincoln may be found guilty of first degree murder or any lesser included crime. To prove the crime of first degree premeditated murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, Vicki Hoffman is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Steve Lincoln. And three, there was a premeditated killing of Vicki Hoffman. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact time, the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. The period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the killing. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the, if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused, of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in considering the evidence, you should consider the possibility that although the evidence may not convince you that the defendant committed the main crime of which he is accused, there may be evidence that he committed other acts that would constitute a lesser included crime. Therefore, if you decide that the main accusation has not been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. You will next need to decide if the defendant is guilty of any lesser included crimes. The lesser crimes indicated in the definition of first degree murder are second degree murder and manslaughter. To prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, Vicki Hoffman is dead. Number two, the, the, the death was caused by the criminal act of Steve Clinton, Lincoln. Therefore, and number three, there was an unlawful killing of Vicki Hoffman by an act eminently dangerous to another and, de and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act includes a series of related actions arising from, <clears throat> excuse me, 
arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is an eminently danger. An act is eminently dangerous to another in demonstrating a depraved mind if it, if it is an act or series of acts that, number one, a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily harm to another, and two, is done with ill will, hatred, spite, or evil, or an evil intent, and three, is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict of second degree murder, it is not necessary that the state prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. To prove the crime of manslaughter, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, Vicki Hoffman is dead. Number two, Steve Lincoln intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of Vicki Hoffman but the death of Vicki Hoffman was caused by the culpable negligence of Steve Lincoln. Every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there is a violation of that duty without any conscious intent to harm, the violation is negligence. The defendant cannot be guilty of manslaughter by committing a mere negligent act or if the killing was either justifiable or excusable, as I have previously instructed you. In order to convict of manslaughter by act, it is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death, only an intent to commit an act that was not merely negligent, justified, or excusable and which caused death. I will now define culpable negligence for you. As I have said, every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there is a violation of that duty without any conscious intent to harm, the violation is negligence. But culpable negligence is more than a failure to use ordinary care towards others. In order for negligence to be culpable, it must be gross and flagrant. Culpable negligence is a course of conduct showing reckless disregard of human life or of the safety of persons exposed to its dangerous effects or such an entire want of care as to raise a presumption of a conscious indifference to consequences or which shows wantonness and, or recklessness or a grossly careless disregard, <coughs> excuse me, disregard for the safety of others, for the safety and welfare of, other, of the public, or such an indifference to the rights of others as to be equivalent to an intentional violation of such rights. A negligent act or omission must have been committed with an utter disregard of the safety of others. Culpable negligence is consciously doing an act or following a course of conduct that the defendant must have known or reasonably should have known was likely to cause death or great bodily harm. It is, a, it is a defense to the crimes of first degree murder, second degree murder, and manslaughter if the actions of Steve Lincoln constitute a justifiable use of deadly force. Deadly force means force likely to cause death or great bodily harm. Great bodily harm means Great as distinguished from slight, trivial, minor, moderate harm. Steve Lincoln does not have the burden of proving a 
that he was justified in using deadly force. Deadly force. Instead, for you to find the defendant guilty, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not justified in using deadly force. The law on justifiable use of deadly force is as, filed, is as follows. Steve Lincoln has had no duty to retreat before using deadly force. If Steve Lincoln was in a dwelling or residence in which he had a right to be, he had no duty of retreat and had the right to stand his ground and use force, including deadly force, if he reasonably believed that such conduct was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or the imminent, imminent commission of either an aggravated assault or aggravated battery against himself. <clears throat> Aggravated assault is defined as follows. We go off and intentionally and unlawfully threaten, either by word or act, to do violence to Steve Lincoln. At no time, Vicki Hoffman appeared to have the ability, at the time, excuse me, at the time, Vicki Hoffman appeared to have the ability to carry out the, the threat. The act of Vicki Hoffman created in the mind of Steve Lincoln a well-founded fear that the violence was about to take place. The assault was made with a deadly weapon. Aggravated battery is defined as follows. Vicki Hoffman actually and intentionally touched or struck Steve Lincoln against his will or intentionally caused bodily harm to Steve Lincoln. Vicki Hoffman and the committee of the battery use deadly force. The use of deadly force is justifiable if Steve Lincoln reasonably believed that the force was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself while residing, while resisting, excuse me, any attempt to murder him or commit an aggravated assault or aggravated battery upon him, upon him or to commit an aggravated assault or aggravated battery upon him, upon or in any dwelling house in which he was present. In deciding whether Steve Lincoln was justified in using deadly force, you must consider the circumstances at the time the force was used. The danger need not, need not have been actual However, to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of imminent danger must have been so real that the defendant actually believed the use of deadly force was necessary. Moreover, to justify the use of deadly force, a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed that the use of deadly force was necessary. Residence means a dwelling in which the person resides either temporarily or permanently or is visiting as an invited guest. However, the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Steve Lincoln used force to initially provoke the use of force against him unless the force asserted toward the defendant was so great that he reasonably believed that he was in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm and had exhausted every reasonable means to escape the danger other than using deadly force on Vicki Hoffman. Or, in good faith, Steve Lincoln withdrew from physical contact with Vicki Hoffman and clearly indicated to Vicki Hoffman that he wanted to withdraw and stop the use of deadly force, but Vicki Hoffman continued and re or resumed the use of force. If you find that Steve Lincoln, who because of prior threats or, or difficulties 
with Vicki Hoffman, had reasonable grounds to believe that he was in danger of death or great bodily harm at the hands of Vicki Hoffman. You may consider this fact in determining whether the actions of Steve Lincoln were those of a reasonable person. If you find that at the time of the alleged first degree murder, second degree murder, or manslaughter, Steve Lincoln knew that Vicki Hoffman had committed an act of acts of violence, you may consider the fact in determining whether Steve Lincoln reasonably believed it was necessary for him to use deadly force. In considering the issue of self-defense, you may take into account the relative physical abilities and capacities of Steve Lincoln and Vicki Hoffman. If you find that Steve Lincoln committed either second-degree murder or manslaughter, and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime, he personally carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a firearm, you should find him guilty of either second-degree murder or manslaughter with a firearm. A firearm is defined as any weapon, including a starter gun, which will, is designed to, or may be readily converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosion, explosive. The frame or receiver of any such weapon, any firearm muffler, or firearm silencer, any destructive device, or any machine gun. If you find that Steve Lincoln committed either second-degree murder or manslaughter, but you are not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he personally carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a firearm, then you should find him guilty only of second-degree murder or manslaughter. If you find that Steve Lincoln committed second-degree murder and you also find, beyond a reasonable doubt, that during the commission of the crime, he discharged a firearm and in doing so caused great bodily harm to or the death of Vicki Hoffman, you will let you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with discharge of a firearm causing great bodily harm or death. Once again, great bodily harm means, means great as distinguished from slight, trivial, minor, or moderate harm, and as such does not include mere bruising. If you find that Steve Lincoln committed second-degree murder, you will also find beyond it, and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he discharged a firearm, you should find him guilty find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with the discharge of a firearm. If you find that Steve Lincoln committed second-degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with actual possession of a firearm. Once again, a firearm is defined as any weapon, including a starter gun, which will, is designed to, or may be readily converted to expel a projectile by the action of, it, of an explosive. The frame or receiver of such weapon, any firearm muffler, or firearm silencer, any destructive device, or any machine gun. To actually possess the fire, a firearm means that the defendant a, carried a firearm on his person. B, had a firearm with an immediate physical reach and ready access to the intent to use the firearm during the commission of a crime. <clears throat> now, the defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This, much, this means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. 
This presumption states for the defendant as to each material allegation to each stage of the trial, unless it's been overcome by the evidence, to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. To overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has, approving, has the burden of proving the crime with which the defendant is charged was committed and the person and the, and the defendant is the person who committed the crime. The defendant is not required to present evidence or prove anything. Now, whatever the words reasonable doubt are used, you must consider the following. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty. If you have an abiding conviction of guilt, on the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a conviction is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. It is the evidence introduced in this trial and to it alone that you're to look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the, of the defendant may arise from the evidence, conflict in the evidence, or the lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty. If you have no reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. It is up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witnesses acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider are if the witness seemed to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified. Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? Whether the state has met its burden of proof does not depend upon the number of witnesses it is called or upon the number of exhibits it is offered but instead upon the nature and quality of the evidence presented. It is entirely proper for a, talk, for a lawyer to talk to a witness about, excuse me, about what testimony the witness would give if called to the courtroom. The witness should not be discredited by talking to a lawyer about his or her testimony. You may rely upon your own conclusion about the credibility of any witness. A juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence or the testimony of any witness. The fact that a witness is employed in law enforcement does not mean that his or her testimony deserves more or less consideration than that of any other witness. Now, expert witnesses are like other witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert witness to give his or her opinion. However, an expert's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe him or her to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. 
Now the defendant in this case has become a witness. You should apply the same rules to consideration of his testimony that you apply to the testimony of other of the other witnesses. <clears throat> now there are some general rules that apply to your discussions and you must follow these rules in order to return a lawful verdict. You must follow the law as it is spelled out in these instructions. If you fail to follow the law, your verdict will be a miscarriage of justice. There is no reason for failing to follow the law in this case, and all of us are dependent upon you to make a wise and legal decision in this matter. This case must be decided only upon the evidence that you would heard, have heard from the testimony of the witnesses and have seen in the form of the exhibits and evidence and these instructions. This case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or are angry at anyone. Remember the lawyers are not on trial your feelings about them should not influence your decision in this case. Your duty is to determine if the defendant has been proven guilty or not in accord with the law. It is my job to determine a proper sentence if the defendant is found guilty. Now, whatever verdict you render must be unanimous. That is, all of you must agree to the same verdict. Your verdict should not be influenced by feelings of prejudice, bias, or sympathy. Your verdict must be based on the evidence and on the law contained in these instructions. Now, deciding the verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. Please disregard anything I may have said or done that makes you think I prefer one verdict over another. You may find the defendant guilty as charged, guilty of a lesser included offense, a lesser included crime, or not guilty. If you return a verdict of guilty, it should be for the highest offense on the verdict form that he for each count that has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find that no offense has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then of course your verdict must be not guilty. The verdict must be unanimous, that is all of you must agree to the same verdict. Only one verdict may be returned as to the crime charge. The verdict must be in writing for your convenience, the necessary verdict form has been prepared for you. And I will now attempt to read it to you. <clears throat> we the jury find as follows. Check only one. A. The defendant is guilty of first degree murder. B. The defendant is guilty of the lesser included crime of second degree murder. Under that, if you find the defendant guilty of second degree murder, you must further determine if the following was proven beyond a reasonable doubt, that please check all that apply. Number one, during the commission of the offense, did the defendant carry, display, use, threaten to use, or attempt to use firearms to so check off yes or no. Two, during the commission of the offense, did the defendant actually possess a firearm? Once again, check off yes or no. Three, did the, during the commission of the offense, did the defendant discharge a firearm? Once again, check off yes or no. <clears throat> Four, did the during the commission of the offense, did the defendant discharge a firearm and in doing so cause great bodily harm or the death of Vicki Hoffman? Once again, check off yes or no. 
page two of the verdict form. C. The defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter. If you, once, if you find the defendant guilty of manslaughter, you must further determine if the following was proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then you have a check hold. Number one, during the commission of the offense, did the defendant carry, display, use, threaten to use, or attempt to use a firearm? Once again, check off yes or no. D, the defendant is not guilty as to count one. So say we all this black day of September 2024, and there's a line for the four persons to sign. Now, both the state and the defendants have now rested their case. The attorneys will now present their final arguments. Please remember that what the attorneys say is not evidence or your instructions on the law. However, do listen closely to their arguments. They're intended, they're intended to aid you in understanding the case. Each side will have equal time with the state, but the state is entitled to divide this time between an opening argument and a rebuttal argument after the defense has spoken. You're ready to proceed. Yes, sir. May I address the podium? gentlemen, I just want to start off by thanking you for your time, your attention, and your patience in this matter. Obviously, this is a very serious crime, and I know you all have been paying very close attention. Some of you have been taking very diligent notes. Um, I do just want to let you know that um, a copy of the jury instructions that were just read to you will go back to the jury room with you. So I know that was like a lot of information. <laughs> um, we hear it all the time, so... We're just kind of used to it, but especially for people who do not do this, and those of you who have not been jurors before, I'm sure it sounded like a lot. So all of it, it's like in a packet, it looks just like this. That will all go back with you, you get one copy. That's why you don't all have copies right now. We give you one copy that way. There's only one floating around, similar with the verdict form, there's only one for obvious reasons. Um, so if you like missed something or didn't understand something, you'll have time to go through it when you get back to the jury room. Um, and the, the law is contained exactly as the judge read it in the instructions. So don't worry about it if you missed something, because obviously these are very important and this is what you have to decide your verdict based off of. <coughs> I do just want to show you all the verdict form, because I know you didn't get to see that as well and it sounds kind of confusing. I'm a visual person, I like to see things, so uh, that's why I made sure to let you know. Obviously, you get to see the jury instructions with your own eyes as well as the verdict form will obviously go back with you. but this is what the verdict form looks like. So um, just like the judge read to you um, and like the instructions tell you, you start with the highest crime. Your, your verdict, if you were to vote guilty, is to be for the highest verdict, the highest count on the verdict form that's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Obviously in this case, that's first degree murder. So if you find that, you only have to check A. Um, under B, second degree murder, there are all of these questions. That you have to answer. They're called interrogatories and there's a portion of the jury instructions. Um, it was towards the end that the judge was reading about um, carrying, displaying, using, threatening to use a firearm, discharging a firearm, and possessing a firearm. 
So the law, um, it's on page seven of the instructions. So if you get confused about how to answer those questions, go to page seven of the instructions. That tells you the law that you need to be able to answer those questions. And again, that's only if you find second degree murder. And then manslaughter is on page two. And it just has the one question. And again, the law for that one question is the same. It's all on page seven. So just like I told you in my opening and talked to you about in jury selection, the instructions tell you to consider the circumstances surrounding the killing. When you're thinking about this, going through the state's evidence, thinking about whether or not the state has proven this crime beyond reasonable doubt, that is what you are to consider, the circumstances. And like the judge told you, to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this defendant committed first degree murder, I had to prove to you three elements. So remember in jury selection, when we were talking about baking a cake, you have to have all or none, right? So it's either all or nothing. The three were, number one, that Vicki Hoffman is dead. I don't really think that there's any dispute about that. Um, she is very clearly deceased. The issue I think is gonna come in for elements two and three. Number two, that the death was caused by the criminal act of this defendant. And number three, that there was a premeditated killing of Vicki Hoffman. So what was the state's evidence? What evidence did you hear that proves beyond a reasonable doubt that this defendant committed a first degree murder, that I have proven to you all three of those elements? Think about all the witnesses that you heard from, what they said, and all the evidence that I've presented to you. Shannon Allred, she told you she was walking her dog right before 9 p.m. She said she remembered because she had just checked her phone because she didn't have a pocket for her phone, so she left it in her apartment when she left to go walk her dog. Between buildings seven and eight, which is where Ms. Hoffman lived. Ms. Hoffman lived in building seven. Remember her apartment was 713. She says, and she specifically remembers that this, the sounds that she heard came from building seven. She could tell. She heard a pop, which in hindsight, she believed was definitely a gunshot. But at the time, she wasn't really thinking, oh my gosh, I just heard a gunshot. But she hears a gunshot, a woman scream followed by two more gunshots in quick succession. She said this took very little time, that it was very fast. You heard from Geraldine Near Cannon. She knew the victim, Ms. Hoffman, and her son, Brayden. She said that just a few days before she was murdered, that she told, she being Vicki, told Miss Cannon that she wanted the defendant to leave. She wanted him to leave her apartment. And isn't it a coincidence that a few short days later that she's murdered? Right after she tells her friend that she wants this defendant to leave. And not only did she want him to leave, but she made a comment to Miss Cannon that she was going home and she was going to cook dinner just for her and Brayden, not for this defendant. Two first responding officers tell you basically the same thing. They arrive. They hear a woman screaming, screaming for help, panicked screams. They enter the apartment. They immediately notice how much blood is inside the apartment, immediately. Extensive amounts of blood, lots of blood, fresh blood. 
one of the officers, I think it was Officer Terranova, described that when they flipped Miss Hoffman over, that her intestines were protruding from her abdomen. That she was very obviously suffering from very serious injuries that they believed to be the result of gunshot wounds and that they could not figure out where all the blood was coming from. It just wouldn't stop. She just kept bleeding. Carolyn Wilder showed you the layout of the apartment both through the, the diagram as well as the videos and the photos. And you saw for yourselves how much blood there was in that apartment. How much blood just in the kitchen that there was. And you heard from Dr. Clark, the cause of death of Vicki Hoffman was three gunshot wounds. Now remember, I believe he said that he labeled them as four, but I don't know if you remember him saying this. He mentioned that he believed that two of the gunshots were related and that he said that he believed that it was because, because of his training and experience that Miss Hoffman would have had to be bent over at the waist in order to obtain those two gunshot wounds. Remember, they enter, you know, upper on her belly. It was like an entry, exit, and immediate re-entry and re-exit. And he said the only way that could happen at that angle is if she was bent at the waist. That's important, and we'll talk about that later. And he ruled that her cause of death was the gunshot wounds and her manner of death was a homicide. Jessica Hoffman told you that afterwards she searched the apartment, not searching it intentionally to search it, but she's, she's cleaning out her dead sister-in-law's apartment. And she noticed, you know, two pieces of chicken in the oven. Now, what does that corroborate? Exactly what Miss Cannon said, Vicki Hoffman said she was going to do this. She was going home to cook dinner for herself and Braden and not for this defendant. Two pieces of chicken, not three. That there was rice in the rice cooker, that there were no knives out, there was no knives in the sink, no knives anywhere. That when the police searched the apartment, when Miss Hoffman searched the apartment, there were no knives other than those knives in the kitchen block. And all of those knives were there, both when the law enforcement was there, and when Ms. Hoffman went to search the apartment after the crime scene was released to her. Now, the defendant obviously flees the scene, does not contact law enforcement, does not call 911. In fact, he drains his bank account, steals multiple license, a license plate along his way. Remember, he stole one from Georgia. He gets one in Michigan that doesn't belong to his car. So he switches license plates at least twice to try to avoid law enforcement detection. And he goes to the opposite side of the country. And when he is stopped, he doesn't stop right away. Granted, no, he didn't flee, but he didn't stop right away. He has five firearms in that vehicle, two within immediate reach, a ton of ammo, a ton of clothes, and beer. And you heard from Elizabeth Ritchie, what did she tell you? That one of those firearms, the silver firearm, which has been entered into evidence and you have photos of, the para ordinance 45 caliber, was sent to her. She compared it to the shell casings, the bullet fragments retrieved from Ms. Hoffman, as well as the ammo that the defendant had with him at the time he was stopped, and they are all a match. He had the murder weapon in his car at the time he was stopped. So, of course, where does this leave the defendant? He knows the state has all of this evidence. He unlike any other witness, got to sit through this entire trial and listen to everything that everyone else said. He got to see everything. 
No other witness gets that privilege. Only him. And he knows all of this evidence. So what is his only choice? To get up on that stand and to bash Vicki Kaufman. To say that she's an excessive drinker. And she's a violent person. That is his only option. Because otherwise, what he's left with is that he fled to the other side of the country with a murder weapon. That's what he's left with if he doesn't assert stand your ground. He has no other option. So of course he's going to come in here and tell you that it was self-defense. Because if he got up on the stand and said he did it, that would be ludicrous. We wouldn't be here. Just because he says that it was self-defense doesn't mean it's time to pack up and go, ladies and gentlemen. Because you still have to evaluate his testimony and whether or not you think it's even remotely believable. All of the state's evidence points in one direction. All of it. That this defendant did it why he did it that's what i told you probably the biggest unanswered question of this case right like i told you in my opening what was their relationship and why did he kill her well luckily motive is not an element that i'm required to prove to you under first degree murder the three elements motive is not one of them i don't have to prove to you why he did it now based on the evidence the state has presented you do we have some potential motives sure What did we hear about? That this defendant routinely bought things for Vicki Hoffman and Brayton. He routinely gave her money. He paid for all of the furniture in that apartment. All of it. He paid for her cosmetic dentistry. And then she has the audacity to come in and tell him that he has to leave. He has to leave. And she didn't cook dinner for him. Maybe he snapped. He just snapped. And he thought, there's no way that you are going to tell me to leave my apartment when I paid for your whole life. I paid for your whole lifestyle. And you're going to tell me to leave? No. So he snaps and he kills her. People have killed people for a lot less. Killed people for a lot less. Maybe that's not why. Who knows, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, the only two people that can tell us why are Mr. Lincoln and Ms. Hoffman. And she can't talk to us about it. Because he took that opportunity away from her. She can't defend herself against anything that he said about her because he took that from her. He took her whole life from her. He took Brayden's mom from him. He left a 10 year old developmentally delayed child alone and counted on him to call the, counted on a 10 year old to do the right thing and call the police when he as an adult couldn't do it, wouldn't do it. Didn't call the police, didn't report that any of this had happened, that she had ever assaulted him in the past, that he was ever afraid of her, never said any of that, didn't stick around. Are these the actions of an innocent man? If he was truthfully defending himself and believed he did nothing wrong, why is every single step he took after that nothing but indicative of guilt? 
Not a single action he took after that is indicative of something that an innocent person does. If you have done nothing wrong, why do you go to the other side of the country? Why do you steal a license plate to try to obscure your identity from law enforcement? Why do you drain your bank account? And remember what Mr. Lincoln said. We'll get to his testimony in my rebuttal. I get a rebuttal argument with you guys because I have the burden of proof, so I get to talk to you last. Remember he said he only grabbed the essentials, okay? stuff to leave to go to work the next day. And for someone who did nothing wrong, that's an awful lot of stuff. States 17J, he practically took an armory with him. I mean, you all this stuff that's over here, the essentials. He had to take this with him. And this is just one of the packages. There's a bunch more. Ammo. 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 Are those the essentials? He was in such a panic, in such a hurry, he was so scared, he had to get out of there. But he took the time to get all of that stuff. And that's how you know that he knew that he shot Vicki Hoffman. Besides the fact that you can look at the crime scene photos and tell it would be obvious to anyone with eyes That someone got shot in that apartment. Especially if you're the one who shot at them. He said he didn't know that he shot her and that he didn't see any blood. Well, from where he says he was standing... Blood, 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 blood. All over. And you can look at these close up. This is States 2C. There is no way, 0% chance, that he was standing that close, especially being someone who's been shooting guns since he was seven years old, that he was standing that close to Vicki Hoffman discharged his firearm at her and did not see himself shoot her. The only way that's possible is if he closed his eyes when he did it. And the only way it's possible that he didn't see the blood is if he kept his eyes closed while he discharged those additional two shots. There is no way, ladies and gentlemen, that that happened the way that he says it does. Just use your common sense. If he is standing I'm five feet tall, so if I laid down on the ground, 
probably about this distance. If I shot one of you from this distance, you're telling me that I couldn't tell if I shot you? Seriously? That's what he wants you to believe. That he shot at her from that close. Couldn't tell he hit her. Well, then explain Shannon Allred to me. How could she hear the scream from outside the apartment? And he couldn't from five feet in front of her. Why would she scream if he didn't shoot her? And once she screamed, I mean, he must have known he shot her. Why else would she scream? And then he goes up to the counter. This part's very unclear. Number one, because I'm not sure how it's physically possible that you walk up to a counter, don't extend your arm, and don't point down, and can somehow shoot over it. So remember, he was very insistent that he did not extend his arm, and that he did not point down, but somehow he made particularly sure not to shoot the counter, because the counter is more important than a human life. And if you are to believe his story of somehow managing to shoot over the counter and shoot Vicki Hoffman, what are the what are the odds? What a horrible coincidence that the only three times he discharges his firearm, he hits his mark every single time. What are the odds of that if he doesn't even see her two out of the three times? The sheer odds of that are astronomical. And not only that, but all of her gunshots, two of them especially, are very close together. Remember, she has the one in the arm, and then the other two that are like right next to each other, like one's in her stomach and one is in her pelvis area. How is it possible that you achieved such a small spread on a person that you weren't, you couldn't even see? People look at people and shoot at them and miss. But he wants you to believe that he couldn't even see her and just somehow accidentally, miraculously hit her all three times? That's ludicrous, ladies and gentlemen. That's like me coming in through the air ducts of the courtroom, okay? That's not reasonable. I'm going to go through Mr. Lincoln's testimony a bit more when I get back up here and talk to you again. But as you're listening to Mr. Stevenson's argument, just keep in mind the things that we've talked about about common sense and reasonableness when you're listening to his explanation for his client's behavior on that night. And I'm going to ask you to find him guilty as charged. Thank you. Please, the court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, I'm going to be addressing the verdict form and the jury instructions a little bit. All right, but first, let me. Could you please? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, when I first came in here, I think for opening statements, I think what I said is there's going to be two different questions. And we're, that's what we're going to talk about right now. One of those is going to be premeditation. The other one is going to be self-defense. Let's talk about premeditation first. Uh, oh, by the way, I just did want to go through the verdict form. Obviously, I am going to be suggesting that this was not a premeditated shooting. A whole lot we're in agreement on, despite, you know, we're lawyers, we're going to argue a lot, we're in agreement on. Obviously, uh, Mr. Lincoln shot um, Ms. Hoffman on August 28th. No denying that. Uh, first degree murder would mean it's a premeditated crime. Obviously what I'm saying to you is this is not a premeditated crime. 
we had some discussion back, remember, in jury selection over whether or not going through a yellow light qualifies as premeditated. And obviously, Ms. Jacobs argued one way because we both knew what the facts were. And I argued, no, of course, your decision at a yellow light is not premeditated. You don't have time to make a decision. Mr. Lincoln told you what happened. Now, the state, that's their job to tell you, no, no he's lying the entire time. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to argue to you, it is the logical explanation here, is that we had a roommate situation. The state wants to say there's more to it than that, but really all we know is we have a roommate situation that devolves after six months. Apparently it's going well in June, because in June there's some positive text messages, but by August it's gone south. Both sides want to leave. Uh, the state said, well, why haven't you left yet? Come on, we've all had to move from one apartment to another. It takes a little time, you gotta work things out. But anyway, on the final night, they get into, and, and Mr. Lincoln, you know, was saying it's not an argument. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that was an argument over your, uh, you're, you're taking money from a church, essentially. She hits him, goes into the, room, into the back room, he kicks the door, says, I'm leaving, goes to his room, gets a bag, as we've been pointed out by the state. He is a guy who clearly believes in the Second Amendment, not a crime. And so he has a bag of stuff, he's going to leave in there, he says he's a, he's a legitimate uh, carrying concealed person, he's got a gun in there, she comes out, says I'm going to kill you, grabs a knife, he fires in what he believes to be self-defense. Now ladies and gentlemen, there's no other motive, as the state pointed out. This is not a case of I'm getting a whole bunch of money from you, it's not a case of oh there's another lover out there, no. It's a case of two people who kind of had it with each other, he's leaving, she wigs on him in a manner which is not outside the realm of possibility. She, she, he's called her out on taking money from the church. She hits him, goes into the room, he kicks her, he's gonna leave, comes out, I'm gonna kill you, pulls out her knife. It's right next to him, he responds. Now, whether that's reasonable self-defense, we'll argue that, but is there anything hard to believe about it? No. <laughs> he has no reason to shoot her other than this. If she had not done that, he would have walked out the door, gone on his way, and we would have had two angry Roommates. The state's trying to tell you that his version of events is A, not believable, and B, not reasonable self-defense. There's no other reasonable explanation. She did something that made him think, oh my gosh, I'm going to get hurt, and he defended himself. Do you think it's reasonable self-defense? We're going to talk about that. But is that the credible, most credible explanation of events? Of course it is. That's what this is. It's at the end of a bad roommate situation. And is it premeditated? No. Premeditated means I'm planning to kill a person. This is, oh my gosh, I just shot somebody. Uh, I'm gonna go to the ATM and I'm gonna go, you all have heard Mr. Uh, Lincoln's accent. Uh, the the uh, Michigan accent's kind of higher, kind of nasal. He's from Michigan. That's why he's going back to Michigan. It's the only lawyer he knows. Is going to talk to a lawyer a reasonable uh, response in this situation? Of course it is. Most lawyers will tell you to do that. As the state will probably point out, you usually steal two Georgia license plates on the way. No, admittedly, that's outside the norm. But it doesn't change the fact that, yeah, that's what he's doing. He's going to talk to the only person he knows that would be able to talk to him about this. So, is this first degree murder? I'm going to say no. I don't think it's even reasonable. It's not a premeditated crime. So at worst, it's second degree murder. And yes, there's some interesting questions here you answer if you vote second degree murder. Did he have a firearm? These are all, would all be yeses. Uh, did he have a firearm? Did he possess the firearm, etc.? Those would be yeses. So if we get past premeditation, we're talking about second degree murder. I just would like to point out, I'm sure it was just a uh, accident, but uh, I think when the state showed you all the possibilities, they, they, they forgot to point out not guilty. That's, that's right there. We'll talk about that one now. Now before I go further though, actually, let me address the jury instructions on what I've just talked about. As we said, the judge read them to you. You'll have a copy in the back room. I hope you guys can read from there. Uh, and you know, I'm not going to read through everything, obviously, the judge has done that. But first degree murder, if you find uh, that it's. Actually, that's not what we need to get to. Hang on, I'll be fine. First degree murder, obviously, I'm saying no. Premeditation didn't exist. I wanted to get to the part where we discussed that. 
There we go. <laughs> As the state, and here's the thing. Ms. Ms. Jacobs and I are going to raise our voices. We're going to get very impassioned. We're in agreement on 80% of this. Yes, she's dead. There's no denying. I'm not trying to be flippant about it. The death was caused by Steve Lincoln, whether it was a criminal act, we'll discuss that. And finally, there's a premeditated killing. So, first degree murder, that's what I'm saying. It's part number three. No, the, the evidence doesn't support it. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period, but you'll be able to read it. Essentially, what I'm saying is that is killing with a predetermined motive. A killing of somebody comes at you and you respond, whether or not we say it's well, that's not premeditated. And keep moving. So therefore, I would suggest to you, at best, you're talking about second degree murder. Vicki Hoffman is dead, caused by, we'll decide if it's a criminal act, and there was an unlawful killing by an imminently dangerous act. Again, if you don't think self-defense is appropriate, then probably second degree murder, or maybe manslaughter is what we're talking about. But, obviously the bulk of what I'm gonna be arguing to you is let's talk about whether it was a justifiable use of deadly force. Now, one thing the state has brought up. Who wrote the laws? Legislature. We gotta abide by the laws. Now, that cuts against my clients. It also cuts against the state. So let's go over the law on, essentially, self-defense. Steve Lincoln does not have the burden of proving he was justified in using deadly force. Instead, for you to find the defendant guilty, the state's got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was not justified in using his deadly force. Here's the law, he has no duty to retreat. Now, I don't mean to get into politics, but at least about 10 years ago, stand your ground, that got a lot of heat from, from certain parties. It's, it's just basically self-defense. It's basically self-defense law. If you're in your own home, you don't have a duty to retreat. A lot of what the state was hammering Mr. Lincoln about was, well, why didn't you back off? Why didn't you go away? Whether they like the law or not, no duty to retreat. Uh, Steve Lincoln had no duty to retreat before using deadly force. He was in a dwelling or residence where he had a right to be. And he was allowed to use deadly force if he feared imminent death or great bodily harm or the imminent commission of aggravated assault or aggravated battery. What's aggravated assault? Vicki Hoffman intentionally and unlawfully threatened either by word or act to do violence to Steve Lincoln. At the time, Vicki Hoffman appeared to have the ability to carry out the threat. The act of Vicki Hoffman created in the mind of Steve Lincoln a well-founded fear. The violence was about to take place. The assault was made with a deadly weapon. That means if a person threatens you with a deadly weapon, when you are in your house where you have the right to be, guess what? You're allowed to respond with the force that he used. Again, doesn't matter if that is a law people like. That's the law. Aggravated assault. I'm going to kill you. Here's my knife. Aggravated assault. Whether you like the law or not, he has the right to respond with deadly force at that point. That's it. We're done. That's the whole case right there. Everything we're arguing about is that. The state wants to bring up whether he fled, whether he went to Michigan. Well, you know, my position would be, or at least an arguable position would be, he didn't behave well after this happened, but it's not indicative of anything opposed to what he said. Would a person who, oh my gosh, I just shot my roommate, grab an ATM, grab what money they have left and run? Sure. There's nothing about that that's hard to believe. But this is what it comes down to. Unless the state can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that didn't happen, like it or not, he's got the right to defend himself. It also, it will say if he was in fear of being cut with a knife, if he was in fear of death or great bodily harm, obviously those would be the, all the things that would come after a person says, I'm gonna kill you and grabs a knife. But that's it. He has the right to defend himself. 
going to keep going here. Obviously, there's some question about what happened to this knife. Let's see if I can get that in. Uh, Mr. Lincoln testified it was a utility knife, which she always carried on her person. Uh, obviously, that utility knife was not found. That said, at the time the police looked around the apartment, they weren't looking for that because they didn't know that's what they needed to be looking for. Anything could have happened to it. A police officer could have thought, oh, this is mine. Uh, it could have been on her person and fallen off on the way to the hospital. It could have been picked up by the uh, visiting sister, but you know what? I'm saying let's not question Mr. Lincoln's testimony, so let's not question hers. It could have been missed by everybody because they didn't know they were looking for it. Essentially, uh, what follows is a regurgitation. It's another way of putting the same issue. I'll just go with what we mentioned first. It's another way of talking about self-defense. As uh, I, I think I said in the in, uh, jury selection, there are things which are going to be important to me that I'll bring out, and there are things that will be important to the state to bring out. Some of those things probably the state may bring out on uh, their rebuttal, so I'll allow them to do that. Weighing the evidence. It's up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. Did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know things about which the witness testified? I want to bring up one of the witnesses' testimony. I think her name was Shannon Ashley and changed her name to Allred, something like that. She was the first witness we, should, we saw. And in fact, the state brought up her testimony a moment ago. They said she, she testified, she was walking her dog about 841, and she hears, bang, ow, bang, bang. What's my point of bringing that up? Mr. Lincoln said himself that that gunshot that was in within about three seconds. This is not premeditated. We have independent evidence that this was three gunshots in a row. This is not something we have an opportunity to think about. And Ms. Allred had the opportunity to see what she testified to. Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? I think where this is probably going to get brought up is in regard to Mr. Lincoln. The state is probably going to tell you Mr. Lincoln couldn't keep his story straight. Mr. Stevenson is going to tell you Mr. Lincoln kept his story straight. The state just kept asking more and more questions about the same things. I remember one of the things they said was in his previous hearing, he had said, I shot her and then I left. Whereas today he said, I shot her, I went back to my room to get some stuff and then I left. The state was like, well, why didn't you bring that up? They can't both be true. Well, of course, they can both be true. It matters about what questions your lawyer asks you. You're nervous on the stand, things like that. I am going to say he did have an accurate memory. The state just kept prodding him and prodding him to try to get him off his ground. You heard in the previous hearing, the prosecutor, he said, I was five to six feet from her. They said, wasn't it more like 10 to 12? Like, okay, 10 to 12. From the point of view of the state, oh, he's changing his story. From the point of view of the defense, uh, Either one is close enough for me holding a knife at you to be a problem. Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Yeah, let's talk about that. Mr. Lincoln sat up on that stand, and I'm going to be honest, Miss Jacobs is an outstanding prosecutor. She will grill you like there is no tomorrow. What was his response? Did he get angry? No. Did he raise his voice? No. Did he lose his temper? No. That is probably the strongest evidence you have. He didn't blow his top when she came at him. Now, admittedly, we're not in a life and death situation. But if the state is trying to say that he's aggressive or he's going to blow his top, no. He behaved politely. Take that into account when you consider his actions at the time. Uh, did the witness have an interest in how the case should be decided? <laughs> Here's one where the state always points out, yes, obviously this guy has an interest in how the case is going to be decided. That does not mean that he's not telling you the truth. Does the witness's testimony agree with other testimony? Again, ladies and gentlemen, the only thing we're really talking about are those few seconds. I'm gonna kill you, bang. That's it, everything else doesn't really matter. It fits into what Ms. Jacobs said is things you might not like to know, but you don't necessarily have to. So, does the witness testimony agree with other testimony? There's only one other testimony we heard 
And that was from Ms. Allred, who said, I heard, ow! Yes, his testimony agrees with that. Next, did the witness at some other time make a statement inconsistent with testimony they gave in court? I think I just discussed that, yes. The state is gonna say Mr. Lincoln was changing his story. I'm gonna say no. When you tell a story multiple times, you won't be exactly the same words every time. And that's where the state was attacking. We go a little bit further. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, it's entirely proper for lawyers to talk to witnesses Again, driving to Michigan is an interesting way to do it, but if it's the only lawyer you know under the circumstances, and say it's within the bounds of at least, I can see a person doing it. Um, this is always the one I want to bring up. It's uh, rules for deliberation. Oh, defendant testifying. Expert witness, we heard from an expert. I have no reason to dispute what the expert told you. Again, like I said, most of the testimony is not really in dispute. Defendant testifying, yeah, that, that testimony is in dispute. Uh, and you know, the state brought up, there's no other witnesses, but ladies and gentlemen, there's no other witnesses. He told you what happened, what he said makes sense. Again, I'd say the bigger question is, do you think it's reasonable self-defense? Fine, have it that discussion, but there's no reason to disbelieve what he's telling you beyond the fact of anybody in that situation is gonna have an adrenalinized view of what happened. Ask a person who's in a car accident, what happened? There may be things that bend, but no, he's not lying to you. Rules from deliberation, follow the law. The case must be decided upon the evidence you've heard. The case must not be decided for anyone because you feel sorry or for angry at anyone. Obviously, a life has been lost. That is tragic. Nobody disputes that. The issue is, though, whether or not the person who shot her, did they engage in justifiable self-defense? This is a big one right here. Number four. I hope you can see it. The lawyers are not on trial. So again, Ms. Jacobs and I, we're going to go at it. That's how it is. She's doing an excellent job. I'm doing my best. It's not which lawyer you like. It is what are the facts. So your duty is to determine whether he's been proven guilty or not, and your verdict must be unanimous. Again, these jury instructions are going to be back there in the back. Just give me one second. I'll turn things back over to Ms. Jacobs in one moment. Nothing for it to come. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Before I get into the bulk of my rebuttal. I do want to talk about premeditation. I know I didn't really go over it a lot, but ladies and gentlemen, it really is as simple. And I know when we're thinking about killing a human being, it sounds very serious, and it is very serious. But running a red light, just like we talked about in jury selection, is just as serious, and it can have the same consequences. You can kill a human being by doing that as well. And when you make that choice, when you're going 60 miles an hour and you decide to run a yellow, even though you know it may turn red, that is a serious decision. And you have time in that moment, in that split instant, to make that choice. You make that choice in that instant. Premeditation is that simple. And in this case, you don't just have the one split-second decision. You have multiple decisions. Every single time this defendant fired that firearm, he had to make a choice. For those of you not familiar with firearms, that's why I asked Elizabeth Ritchie. In order to expel a projectile from a gun, what do you have to do? Pull the trigger. Bullets just don't fly out of the gun on their own. Every single one of those shots, one, two, three, he had to make a choice. He had to think, do I want to pull this trigger? It was not an accident. He did it on purpose. 
And every time he did that, he made a choice. Just like running a yellow light. Every single time. It doesn't matter that it happened quickly. The law tells you that. If you believe that at the time that he pulled the trigger, that he intended to kill her, that is enough for premeditation. And I think even if you don't think he intended to kill her at the first shot, which I think he did, because even if you believe his testimony, and he's standing, let's say he's standing at the most, give him, be the most generous, 12 feet from her, at the least five feet from her, if you point at someone with a gun and shoot it at them, you know, everyone knows what happens when you shoot someone with a gun. Everyone knows. Put that one aside. Let's say you don't think, okay, maybe that one was a fluke or whatever. The next two, for sure. For sure. Because again, even if you believe his testimony, which I don't think you should, but even giving him the benefit of the doubt, and if you believe everything that he says, those next two shots were not necessary. Because if you believe that he was defending himself for the first one, which there is zero evidence other than what he says to support that, <coughs> the threat was completely gone after that. Completely gone. Because from the other testimony, we know that Ms. Hoffman got shot, we know she screamed, we know she was injured, and even by his own admission, he could not see her. How can someone be a threat to you if you can't even tell what they are doing? If you can't tell whether or not someone is coming at you with a knife or going to shoot you, how can you say that they are a threat? You can't. He didn't even see her. How is it possible that she could injure him if he couldn't see her? So those next two shots, at a minimum, were not necessary and are premeditated because there was no reason for him to shoot her an additional two times. And if you don't think that that constitutes premeditation, then again, at a bare minimum, it is second degree murder. Because it was imminently dangerous and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. You do not shoot at a human being three times, especially someone who's been around guns their whole life and not realize how dangerous that is. Not realize the consequences of your actions. Mr. Stevenson is right, absolutely, that I have to prove that this defendant was not justified in using deadly force. And I think how the state proved that is not only through the state's case, but also just because what Mr. Lincoln says is not believable. And if you don't believe any part of his testimony, then there is no evidence to support self-defense. None. None of the state's evidence, even remotely, leans in that direction. And even the self-defense instruction, which Mr. Stevenson didn't really point out to you, but one of the most important words, which is one of the most important words that I've been using throughout this entire process, is reasonable. All of these beliefs had to have been reasonable and imminent, meaning immediate. He had to immediately and reasonably believe that he had no other choice, no choice, 
but to shoot her to prevent him being murdered or have an aggravated assault or an aggravated battery committed against him. And I want to point out to you that these instructions about aggravated assault and aggravated battery does not mean that Vicki Hoffman actually did those things. You have to decide if that is what happened. If you believe that is what happened, then you talk about justifiable use of deadly force. Just because it's written like that doesn't mean like the judge is telling you Vicki Hoffman did commit an aggravated assault and Vicki Hoffman did commit an aggravated battery. Those are just the definitions of those crimes because we can't exactly tell you he <laughs> He's concerned about these crimes and then not us not tell you what those crimes are. That would be kind of confusing. So that doesn't mean that she did those things. We just have to tell you what they mean in order for you to make a reasoned decision. deadly force, this paragraph right here, this one in the middle, that's the most important one. And this is only if you believe his testimony. Let me just put that out there because I don't think that his testimony holds water, but you must consider the circumstances. In order to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of imminent danger must have been so real the defendant actually believed the use of deadly force was necessary. And moreover, <laughs> that a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed deadly force was necessary. What do we know about Vicki Hoffman? Sure, she likes guns. Mr. Stevens is right, that's not a crime. It's not a crime that the defendant likes guns. It's not a crime that she likes guns. She was a bubbly person, a happy person according to people who knew her, who loved her. A bubbly, happy, energetic person. Not a violent person. Not an aggressive person. Not a person who carried knives or guns on her person. The only person who says that about her is this defendant. The only one. And I'm sure you saw how Ms. Hoffman and Ms. Bacon reacted when we asked them those questions about Vicki. Like, God no. <laughs> and the whole stabbing her ex thing, that never happened. Again, the only evidence of anything bad about Vicki Hoffman comes from the person who needs you to believe that she was some drunk, crazy, alcoholic, violent psychopath because that's the only way you can believe him. But the people who knew her said that that could not be farther from the truth. And Self-defense doesn't make any sense for a number of reasons. Why would Ms. Hoffman want to kill Mr. Lincoln? Why? Because the only thing that we've heard about is that he said he was leaving, which is exactly what she wanted. Why would she be mad if she's getting what she wants? Why would she threaten to kill him if he's doing what she told him to do? 
That doesn't make any sense. And why would when Vicki Hoffman is in that back bedroom where she has access to a firearm, we know from the photos it's still in that drawer. Why would she, a five foot three, and again, I'm five feet tall, Mr. Lincoln, you stand up, Mr. Lincoln, please. Look at me next to him. <clears throat> you can sit down, thank you. Why would she bring a knife to a gunfight? She knows he has guns. If she really wanted to kill him, she had a gun. Why wouldn't she bring the gun and shoot and kill him? Why would she risk being overpowered and outmatched by someone who is bigger than her and stronger than her and she knows has a gun? Why would she do that? That makes zero sense. If you're going to kill somebody, probably want to make sure you're actually going to do it. Why would she go into a situation knowing she's going to lose? That doesn't make any sense because it didn't happen, because it's not true. She never had a knife. There is no knife. Mr. Stevenson wants you to think that there's this crazy speculative theory about a disappearing knife. You heard absolutely no evidence to support that a knife fell out on her way to the hospital. And I asked the officer, did you search her? Would you have searched her before you even put her in the ambulance? Yes. They looked around her. Officers are not going to take things from a crime scene. Mr. Stevens is like, oh, maybe an officer would have been like, oh, that's mine. They left their med bag. You think they're going to take a knife from a crime scene? And that definitely was theirs. That's not Vicki Hoffman's med bag. That's theirs from them trying to save her life. And they left that, but they're going to take a knife? That's ludicrous. That is speculation. That's not reasonable. The knife didn't disappear because it didn't exist. Look through the crime scene photos. Watch that video again if you need to. It shows you the counters. It shows you the floor. It shows you the whole apartment. You can look at the whole thing. You can watch it as many times as you want. You can look at those photos as many times as you want. There are no knives other than the ones in the knife block. And they're all there. And even if she had a knife, ladies and gentlemen, how reasonable is it that if your intestines are exposed, that you are going to hide a knife? Her intestines are coming out, and she's thinking, oh, I have to hide this knife. And she manages not to get blood wherever she hides it? Because naturally, the police, what are they going to do? Follow the blood. Where does the blood lead us? Oh, look, it leads us to this knife that she hid. That didn't happen because it's not true. And it's ludicrous to even suggest it. Weighing the evidence. Mr. Stevenson is absolutely right. This is my favorite part of the jury instructions. And just like I told you in jury selection, what does it tell you right there at the top? You should use your common sense. Do not check your common sense, ladies and gentlemen, when you get back in that door. Three, four, five, and six pertain to the defendant and the defendant alone. I mean, I think all the state's witnesses were obviously honest and straightforward. I mean, the opposite kind of pertains to the defendant. And we'll go through them one at a time. Number three, was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Tells you. Consider how the witness has acted as well as what they said. That means you can consider 
How did Mr. Lincoln act when Mr. Stevenson was asking him questions? And then how did Mr. Lincoln act when I was asking him questions? And think about some of the answers that he gave to some of the questions that I had. Mostly when it came to women. His lawyer at the Stand Your Ground. The prosecutor at the Stand Your Ground. The prosecutor here. What do we all have in common? Have the same thing in common with Vicki Hoffman. We're all women. He didn't seem to like any of us very much at all. He blamed his lawyer for what happened in the Stand Your Ground. He blamed Sarah Hassler, the prosecutor in the Stand Your Ground, or the hearing. This is a, it was just like a random hearing. I'm saying Stand Your Ground because I'm looking at the jury instructions for it. <laughs> he blamed them for his answers. And he blamed me for his answers here today. He puts the blame on everyone but himself. He puts the blame on Vicki Hoffman. He puts the blame on me. He puts the blame on Sarah Hassler. He puts the blame on his own attorney at a hearing where he testified of his own free will. We put the words in his mouth. We confused him. Never his fault. But he couldn't even answer a simple yes or no question. Think about how many times the judge had to tell him just to please answer my questions. Did he do that to Mr. Stevenson? <laughs> Did it matter that Mr. Stevenson asked him the same question multiple times? No, he gave the same answer to Mr. Stevenson. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're telling the truth, it shouldn't matter how many times you tell it. Because guess what? The truth don't change. No matter how many times you tell it, the truth does not change. And he would change his answer from question to question. He would say something. He would say it. I would repeat it back to him. And then he would say, no, that's not true. Well, I'm just repeating what you said. So no, he was not honest and straightforward in answering our questions, especially me. Did he have some interest in how the case should be decided? He is the only witness who has any interest. He has all the interest. He has every reason for you all to believe his ludicrous story and to think that Vicki Hoffman was some horrible person. He has every interest to believe that. None of the other witnesses have any interest in this case. Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence entered in the case? No. This defendant's testimony agrees with nobody. Nobody. Shannon Allred said she heard a scream. Did the defendant ever say he heard Vicki Hoffman scream? Ever. At that hearing today? No. He never once said he heard her scream. The officer said, the first responding officer said, the oven was on and smoking. What does that logically mean she was doing, ladies and gentlemen, cooking dinner like Geraldine Cannon said she'd be doing? Did he say she was cooking dinner? No, he never said that. He never said she started to cook ever in the hearing here today. That was never in his timeline. How did the oven get on? How did that stuff end up in the oven if she never did it? He never talked about that. Crime scene photos. Remember what Carolyn Wilder told you about blood spatter. Blood spatter goes in a straight line. It doesn't move around corners. So if Mr. Lincoln was standing behind the counter when he shot Vicki Hoffman, Here, 
How did blood get on these lines? If blood doesn't move around corners, remember what Carolyn Model said, blood goes in a straight line. What's a straight line to those lines? This is the door right next to the blinds. This is the kitchen. If he was standing in the kitchen and shot her, where would the blood go? Straight back onto those blinds, ladies and gentlemen. Blood goes in straight lines. Doesn't go around corners. If he shot down at her over the counter, how did that blood get on those blinds? Didn't jump over there by accident. And that matches up with where the shell casings are. Where are the shell casings? In the kitchen. If he was standing in the living room, why are the shell casings in the kitchen? If he was standing behind the counter, why are the shell casings in the kitchen? None in the living room. Not a one. Why is that shell casing, number seven, in this corner? How did it get there if he was never standing in the kitchen? Tell me again how his testimony lines up with the evidence in this case. No one can make that up. Can't change that. Crime scene don't lie. People lie. People protect themselves when they know that they've done something wrong. Crime scene evidence doesn't do that. He is the only witness who has made inconsistent statements in this case and the defense can get up here all day and say that his testimony was not inconsistent with his standard, the hearing testimony his Sandra Brown claim, his self-defense claim. They can stand up here and say that all day and it doesn't make it true. This coming from the person who said he had tension with a 10-year-old boy. He said that, he had tension with a 10-year-old boy. An adult grown man. All this stuff happens. She's invading his privacy. She's pulling knives on him and he doesn't move out. He doesn't call the police. None of that. He doesn't shoot her any of those times. What was so different about this time and those other times she was supposedly waving knives at him that now was the time that he had to shoot her? Why now? Why not then? Because none of it ever happened. And him saying that both of those things happened on the same day is ludicrous. On the same day, she buys this knife block, waves knives in his face, and also just happens to tell him that she stabbed her ex in the neck. That all happens on the same day. Just Casual, hey, yeah, well, this one time I stabbed my ex in the neck with a knife. It's not so crazy. I'm so crazy. It didn't happen. That's not reasonable. And he said he was scared. He was scared and he didn't leave. Didn't even leave the apartment. Didn't even say, oh yeah, I left right after that. But on this day, on this occasion, in August of 2016, he has to shoot her. There is no way Vicki Hoffman was talking to her son Brayden 
when this defendant was leaving that apartment. If she was, she was telling him, go get help because I've been shot. There's no way they were having a calm, normal conversation. And you know that because look at the state of Vicki Hoffman. Someone with their intestines hanging out and suffering from multiple gunshots is not going to have a calm conversation with their 10-year-old. And there is 0% chance that he did not know what he had done to Vicki Hoffman. Zero. Because none of what he says makes any sense. It doesn't line up with any of the evidence. And it is not a reflection of who Vicki Hoffman was. It is not. Period. Point blank. End of story. That is who Vicki Hoffman was. And he made sure that she could not come in here and defend herself to you. He made sure of that. He made three choices on that day. Every single time he pulled that trigger, he made sure that she would be silenced forever. Do not let him get away with that. Find him guilty as charged. I need the verdict form. Yes, sir. Do you have it? Can I approach?
I will answer any question if I can in writing or orally here at open court. Now, during the trial, I have received into evidence as exhibits. You may examine whatever exhibits you think will help you in your deliberations. These exhibits will be sent into the jury room with you when you begin deliberations. In closing, let me remind you that it is important that you follow the law spelled out in these instructions and decide in your verdict. There are no other laws that apply to this case. Even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. For more than two centuries, we've lived by a constant by the Constitution and the law. No one of us has a right to violate rules we all share. Did I give the instructions I said I would give, Counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. And we now retire to consider your verdict, but Mr. Summit, Mrs. Mako, if you'll remain here a moment.